Welcome to Spooky Saturdays. I am your hostess, the Reading Dragon. Tonight, I read a little tale by horror author Ron Ripley as he writes about a boy who decided to do some vandalizing at his local cemetery and the consequences he faced. Let this story serve as a lesson for when you are running through an unfamiliar place. Remember, don't try to take the shortcut. At 16 years old, Mark LeBlonde wasn't afraid of anything. He could handle the beatdowns from his father. He could handle whatever the rest of the world decided to throw at him. What he couldn't handle, though, was Stephanie Ural's rejection. She was hot, and he wanted to date her. She didn't feel the same. Not at all, Mark thought. He cut through the driveway of an abandoned house on Pierce Street, reached the iron fence of the cemetery, and hoisted himself up. With great care, he avoided the points of the metal posts, hooked his foot into the top crossbeam, and jumped over onto the grass. The air seemed colder in the cemetery, the night sky darker. Mark ignored them both. He didn't believe in ghosts. And even if they were real, what could they do to me? He thought. He stuffed his hands into his pants pockets and dropped his head down slightly. Anger raced through him and flared up occasionally as he thought of Stephanie and her rejection. He released it each time with a kick to a tree or a wire mesh trash can placed along the cemetery road. As he passed into the older section near the cemetery center, he saw a white headstone. The marker leaned crazily to the right and looked as though a strong breeze would knock it over. Mark paused and looked at the stone, and then he smiled. He left the cemetery road and walked across the grass, taking his hands out of his pockets. The stone of the marker was cold beneath his fingers. He gripped the top of the headstone, the surface pitted and worn from years of exposure, and he pushed. The tendons in his neck strained and his shoulders ached, but Mark continued to press his weight against the stone. With a groan and a strange squeal, the marker went over, and Mark stepped back as it crashed to the ground. He could feel the vibration of it through his feet, and Mark realized he felt great. He felt strong. He shook his head, laughed, and looked around for another. Half a dozen feet away, another headstone was cockeyed on its wide base, and Mark knew it would go. He stomped over to it, took it in both hands, as he had done the other, and shoved it. And while his muscles ached and screamed at the sudden, unexpected effort, the stone went over. Mark let out a triumphant shout. Forget Stephanie, he told himself. There are other girls, and this is a hell of a lot more fun than chasing her around. Mark nodded in agreement with himself, scanned the rows of headstones, and spotted another a few feet away. In less than 20 minutes, he stood by a tall monument to some long-dead soldier and panted, 
he had managed to push over six stones. The last one had split in two, and it made all of the new aches and pains he felt worthwhile. He leaned against the monument. The cold of the stone worked its way through his clothes and into his flesh. But it was all right. All of it was all right. What are you doing? A voice asked. Mark nearly jumped as he twisted around to see the speaker. A tall man, probably as old as his father, stood a dozen feet away and stared at Mark. The guy wore an old uniform. Probably one of those dumb reenactors, Mark thought, and he sneered at the man. Mind your business, Pops, Mark said dismissively. The man took a step closer. I am minding my business. What are you doing? I'm telling you to get lost. Go back to whatever stupid game you were playing, loser, Mark said, shaking his head. Did you knock down all those gravestones? The man demanded. So what? Mark said, straightening up and crossing his arms over his chest. So what if I did? What are you going to do, call the cops? Good luck proving it. I'll just deny it. No witnesses. Anger flashed over the man's pale face, and he took another step forward. What are you going to do, old man? Mark asked, laughing. You think you can really handle me? I'll beat you bloody and drag you out onto the sidewalk so everyone can see you bleed. Is that what you think you'll do, young man? The stranger asked softly. I know it is, Mark spat. He sized up the man in front of him and <laughs> laughed. The man smiled grimly and walked forward. He passed directly through a headstone. Mark blinked. The man continued to glide forward and went through a second stone. He's a ghost, Mark realized. He turned and ran. In the darkness of the night, he sped around markers and trees until he reached the cemetery road again. He glanced back once and saw the dead man was just a few feet behind him, not even running. The man's legs weren't moving anymore. It was as though he was tied with an invisible cord to Mark. Mark stumbled, caught himself, and aimed for the Kinsley Street entrance. Why are you running? The ghost asked mockingly. I thought you were going to fight me. Teach me a lesson like you said. Mark didn't answer. He raced through the granite posts which marked the entrance. Another glance back showed the ghost stopped at the edge and Mark let out a <laughs> laugh. But it was cut short by Camaro. The car smashed into him. Mark couldn't scream. He couldn't even breathe. In what felt like slow motion, he watched the world tumble around him. Buildings spun, and Mark realized he couldn't hear anything. The world was silent. He vaguely felt the impact of his body as it crashed into the pavement, almost as if it wasn't really happening to him. I just bounced, he thought tiredly, the world racing away from him again. And then he was back on the pavement. He rolled and shuddered and rolled again. Headlights illuminated the road, which he could barely see. A film of red had fallen over his eyes. Nothing looked right. He tried to move his head, 
and found he couldn't. The world seemed frozen, or at least he was. Someone's feet came into view. Nike sneakers, pink with black trim and black laces. New by the looks of them. On the pavement, a dark liquid spread out slowly, and Mark realized he could still smell things. Things like burnt rubber and hot oil. A strong, coppery scent which he couldn't quite place. And Mark smelled urine, too. Again, he tried to move, but nothing responded. Not even his toes. The person with the Nikes came to a stop and squatted down. A middle-aged man, wearing jeans and a sweater. A shocked look was frozen on the man's face. Even though the world was red, the man's face stood out in sharp relief. The man, who must have been the driver of the car, had a strong, almost movie star face. His hair was combed back away from his forehead. He even had a biker's mustache, both sides hanging down well past the man's chin. A single earring glittered in the stranger's right ear. The shock slowly left the man's face, horror and disbelief settling in. A moment later, the man was joined by another person, a priest. The priest dropped down to his knees, and Mark realized the man was barefoot, shirt untucked, and collar half in. More than likely, he had run from the St. Patrick's Rectory, which was just a block up. Mark felt strange as he looked and examined the small bit of the world available to his frozen eyes. The priest was an old man, pale-faced with white blonde hair. He was chubby, and he had a look of genuine concern. The priest's lips moved, and he reached out a hand. Mark knew the hand was on his head, but he couldn't feel it. He couldn't feel anything. I'm dying, Mark thought sadly. I'm really dying. He wanted to cry, but he couldn't. Then, just beyond the man and the priest, Mark saw him, the soldier ghost from the cemetery. The dead man crossed his arms and smiled. Through him, Mark could see the cemetery's iron fence, and beyond that, the small chapel and the office. The man's expression was one of self-satisfaction, as though a job had been well done. In the silence of his own thoughts, Mark heard another voice and saw, with rising horror, it was the ghost who spoke. Did you like your little run? The ghost asked. Neither the driver nor the priest reacted to the dead soldier. They didn't hear him. I enjoyed it, the ghost said drifting closer. The driver rubbed his arms, and in the glow of the car's headlights, Mark saw goosebumps erupt on the man's neck. Oh, yes, the soldier said, nodding. Yes, I enjoyed it tremendously. Mark wanted to close his eyes, to look away, to do everything anything other than stare at the ghost, but he couldn't. Do you know what the priest is doing right now? The dead man asked. 
No, I imagine you do not. He is giving you your last rites. He is preparing the way for your death. And eventually, you will either descend or ascend. I highly doubt it shall be the latter, however. The soldier moved a few steps further. Mark watched, both fascinated and horrified at the way the small hairs on the priest's neck stood up at the ghost's nearness. I suppose you should have looked before you ran, the ghost said. Just as I suppose you should not have knocked over those headstones. Lights flashed on the trees, and Mark knew the police or an ambulance had come. But he also knew he was dying. He could feel it. The soldier grinned. Yes, you'll be dead shortly. And if I were kind, I would let you slip away. But you weren't kind, were you, boy? No. No, you weren't. So I think perhaps you will stay with me for a while. Perhaps I will educate you on kindness, decency, and respect. You see, boy, there is a hierarchy in death. And since you've been a wretched beast of a child, the angel of death is in no rush to reap your soul. You'll be mine. Who knows for how long? But for now, your soul is mine. With the last word, the ghost stepped between the driver and the priest, leaned down, and thrust his hand into Mark's chest and squeezed. Mark felt a tug, and when the soldier withdrew his closed fist, he held something long and silver. It looked much like a length of rope, and as Mark felt it being slowly pulled out of his chest, he realized it was his soul. Mark watched the ghost continue to drag the silver cord out of his chest, past the driver and the priest, whose lips moved in silent prayer. Mark felt his heart slow down, the pace between each heartbeat growing longer. The ghost smiled grimly, gave one final tug, and Mark's heart ceased to beat. Suddenly, he found himself in the soldier's grasp, the dead man dragging him towards the cemetery. Mark, dazed, looked out onto Kinsley Street. He saw a police officer running towards the driver of the car and the priest, both of whom had their backs to Mark. On the pavement in front of them, crumpled and in a pool of blood, was Mark's own body. Come, boy, the ghost said sharply. It's time for your education. Mark tried to free himself, but the soldier's grip was too strong. Darkness reached out from the cemetery and enveloped him as fear tore a scream from his throat. Thank you for listening to my narration of this story. If you like my narration and want to hear more, please hit that like button, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and follow me on Twitter at 
Ava Two Star, so that you can be notified of when I post a new video. Thank you again for listening to The Reading Dragon.